Whenever I look at the map of Russia, there's always one city that really sticks out, clearly marked on any map, as it is the capital of Primorsky Krai. Vladivostok sits on the very edge of mainland Russia. It is about 6,400 kilometers east of Moscow and only about 6,000 kilometers north of the northernmost islands of Australia. Far closer are the capitals of North and South Korea, as it is just 680 kilometers southwest to Pyongyang and 740 to Seoul, respectively. But while its neighbors, such as Seoul, harbor almost 10 million people, Vladivostok itself is only the 27th largest city in Russia, with a very European sized population of about 600,000. While this may make Vladivostok sound remote, it is in fact the largest port in the Far East region of Russia, making it an invaluable asset with an annual throughput of 10 million tons. One of the most well-known unofficial symbols is Zilyoni Ugol, the green corner, the largest market for used Japanese cars in Russia, which has played an important role in the economy of the city ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Vladivostok is also the final destination of the famous Trans-Siberian Railway, which connects most of the major cities of Russia, creating the world's longest railway line. Meaning, with just one connection in Moscow, you could take a train all the way to St. Petersburg or even Paris. So let's talk about it. Who lived in these lands before Russians occupied them? When and why Vladivostok was established? How did the city contribute to the wars of the early 20th century? And most importantly, how is it possible that you can cut a car in half, ship it from Japan, weld it back together and make a profit? Let's roll! The earliest mention of civilization in the region goes back to 698. Archaeological evidence suggests that Balhai culture was an amalgamation of high tank Chinese, Korean and Tongos cultures with a population of about 500,000. There was little to no agriculture yet and so most of the kingdom's population was semi-nomadic. There's evidence of these people using both traditional Chinese imported from the Tang dynasty, but there's also evidence of them having developed their own scripts. Of course, Chinese historians today have very practical reasons for claiming that the early civilization in the region spoke some version of Chinese, thereby giving China a legitimate cultural claim to the region. Not that Russia cares. Have you heard about the Kuril Islands? Japanese people lived there for centuries and they're never getting those back. A final interesting possibility about the Balhae people may be that an eruption of Mount Pektu between 930s and 940s may have put an end to this civilization. This speculation is based on records of massive population displacement into the nearby region during the period. After this, the lands were mostly inhabited by Mongolic tribes, including the Mongols themselves, who invaded around 1233, enveloping this region into relative historical darkness and obscurity. While some Chinese settlers may have returned to the lands in the centuries after this, they remained sparsely populated mostly because the Chinese, Koreans and even the Japanese chose to pursue policies of self-isolation and protectionism, since they had suffered so much from the onslaught of the Mongol hordes. Historically, this didn't work out for them as the East Asian nations were all technologically and economically eclipsed during the most important years of exploration and colonialism, giving European nations the opportunity to expand, some of which expanded a lot. As the various remaining Mongolian states collapsed, Russia rose and filled the power vacuum left behind, expanding all the way to the easternmost corners of the continent and even Alaska. They did eventually bump into Chinese resistance, however, and were temporarily stopped, but this did not last long as multiple European powers brought the once great empire to its knees during the Opium Wars. And so after being thoroughly humbled, China was forced into a number of so-called unequal treaties, which were extremely favorable for the European powers. So in 1858 and 1860, the defeated Chinese gave Russia what it wanted, more land. But this land was different, for it finally gave Russia the deep water port it had been searching for and an opening into the Pacific Ocean. And so on July 2nd, 1860, a military unit was sent to the Golden Horde Bay to establish an outpost, which received the name Vladivostok. Also, a special commission made a decision on the appointment of Vladivostok as the main port of the Russian Empire in the Far East. 
In 1880, Vladivostok officially received the status of a city. It prospered as many new trade relations were established and lots of foreign workers started flocking to the city. The city arguably reached its golden age when the final segments of the Trans-Siberian Railway were completed, along with the Chinese Eastern Railway in the 1890s. And so by the end of the century, the city reached a population of over 100,000. However, difficult times lay ahead for Russia and one of the first major events which set its imperial government on course for destruction happened in the Far East. Seeing Russia as a rival, Japan offered to recognize its dominance in Manchuria in exchange for recognition of Korea being within the Japanese sphere of influence. Russia refused and demanded the establishment of a neutral buffer zone on the 39th parallel in North Korea. The Japanese government perceived a threat to their plans for expansion into mainland Asia and chose instead to go to war. So after these negotiations broke down, the Japanese Navy opened hostilities in a surprise attack against the Russian Eastern Fleet at Port Arthur in China. Port Arthur fell to the Japanese and the Russian fleet stationed there was told to link up with the one stationed in Vladivostok. Another fleet was on its way from the Baltic Sea. It too was on its way to link up in Vladivostok. This led up to the famous Battle of Tsushima. It was naval history's first and last decisive sea battle fought by modern steel battleship fleets. Meaning there has never been any other battle where a fleet made up of modern vessels was completely annihilated. It was probably the most humiliating defeat in Russia's history, which lost all its battleships and most of its cruisers and destroyers. An estimated 127,242 tons of ships were sunk during the encounter. 99.6% of this weight belonged to Russian ships. The Japanese Navy was faster, more modern, and it did not have to swim halfway around the world to get to its target. So before I move on, I have to talk about this epic journey of the Baltic fleet. One of the first incidents of the trip occurred when the whole fleet decided to open fire on Japanese torpedo boats. What they actually did was open fire on a British trawler and somehow managed to hit their own ships in the process. This was while they were still in the North Sea. The incident came extremely close to having Britain declare war on Russia, but in the end they merely denied them the access to the Suez Canal, meaning that Russia now had to go all the way around Africa. They had a long stopover in Madagascar during a funeral for a crew member who died of illness, and a live shell was used by an accident in the gunnery salute, which hit one of their own cruisers, the Aurora. So they finally managed to get in close to Japan and the Admiral decided to try to sneak between Japan and Korea under the cover of darkness to make it to Vladivostok. All the ships extinguished their lights to maintain stealth except for one hospital ship, the Orel, who kept them burning in accordance with rules of war. Then a Japanese ship spots the Orel, comes in close to investigate determines that it could be a supporting vessel for a Russian fleet, or RL for its own part, misidentifies the Japanese vessel as a Russian one and sends them a message telling them about the fleet that's nearby. The complete Japanese victory surprised international observers and transformed the balance of power, resulting in Japan's emergence as a new player on the international stage and Russia's decline in prestige and influence in Europe. The humiliating defeat for the Russian Empire contributed to growing domestic unrest, which culminated in 1905, Russian Revolution, and accelerated the disintegration of the Russian autocracy. The war also marked the first victory of an Asian country against a Western power in modern times. This wasn't all bad for Vladivostok. Now that Russia was no longer leasing Port Arthur from the Chinese, it once again became the most important trading port in the Far East, even though it would freeze over during winter time whereas Port Arthur stayed open year-round. The population of the city exceeded 100,000 and most curiously, Russians accounted for less than half of all these people. At 10 minutes past 7 this evening, Germany declared war on Russia. The troops situated in Vladivostok were not supposed to get involved in the fighting, but to continue serving in the Far East. After all, the now powerful Japanese Empire was nearby. And until 1914, all Russian troops in the Far East were preparing for a conflict with Japanese. Luckily, however, on August 23, 1914, Japan declared war on Germany, actually joining the alliance of England, France and Russia. This was not done out of altruistic motives, but with a desire to seize the colonies of the Second Reich on the Chinese coast and the Pacific Islands. This almost allied status of the Japanese neighbor made it possible to begin the mobilization and transfer of Siberian divisions, as they are so called, to the German facing front. 
So it is curious that the Germans during the First World War referred to the Cossacks from the Far East as Manchurian Cossacks, whereas Russians themselves would call them as the Siberian Cossacks. The conflict with Germany blocked the sea trade of St. Petersburg and other Baltic Finnish ports of the Russian Empire. And when Turkey entered the war three months later, the ports of the Black Sea also became useless. Murmansk and their railway to it simply did not exist yet at the start of the war. And the port of Arkhangelsk also usually just froze up. All international trade and war aid now had to go through Vladivostok and it became imperative to accelerate the construction of new port facilities. After general mobilization, the size of the Russian army exceeded 5 million people, and the hostilities unfolded over a vast area. The gigantic front and the huge number of troops required an unprecedented expenditure of material resources. Russia exhausted its resources almost immediately within months of the beginning of the war. Since its own industry could not cope with the growing military orders, only purchases from abroad and their delivery to the front through Vladivostok could supply Russia's desperate defense. Intensive work on the expansion of the Vladivostok port started immediately after the start of the war. So by 1915, the port received a million tons of foreign cargo, almost four times more than in 1913. Ironically, while Japan was still perceived to be the biggest threat in the East, it was their support of 970,000 rifles which equipped some 20 divisions of men. Of course, Russia paid a high price for these rifles. In 1916, payments in Russian gold for military orders approached 300 million rubles, accounting for more than half of all of the budget revenues of the Japanese Empire. The only other option was to give up possession of land. With all of these goods arriving in Vladivostok, the railway could not cope with the load and they tried to solve the problem by importing even more. They imported steam locomotives and carriages from the United States. Indeed, most American steamers that arrived in Vladivostok in 1914 were loaded with steam locomotives, wagons, rails and other railway equipment. Russia bought more than 13,000 cars in the USA and Canada. All of them disassembled were delivered by sea to Vladivostok. Despite the Russian efforts to export everything to the front, Vladivostok was the main bottleneck and cargo began to accumulate. The total cost of imported materials piling up on the main port of the Far East was estimated at more than one and a half billion Tsarist rubles, which was equal to half of the budget of the Russian Empire in the pre-war years. After 1917, the war became increasingly unpopular with Russian populace. Political and social unrest grew with the Marxist anti-war Bolshevik party increasing its support and large numbers of common soldiers either mutinied or deserted from the Imperial Russian Army. This led up to the Treaty of the Brest-Litovsk. The Communist Party essentially had enough power to negotiate its own peace treaty with Germany and the Central Powers. Faced with these events, the British and the French governments decided upon the Allied military intervention in Russia. And the first Allied troops, mostly made up of US soldiers, were sent to Arkhangelsk and Vladivostok in order to protect the supplies that had been piling up in the port cities from falling into the hands of the Germans. The Japanese could now also freely enter Vladivostok and points along the China-Russia border. 70,000 Japanese troops poured into Russia in this way. The deployment of such a large force for a rescue operation made the Allied powers wary of Japanese true intentions. And by November 1918, the Japanese occupied all ports and major towns in the Russian maritime provinces. They desired the establishment of, of a buffer state in Siberia, and the Imperial Japanese Army General Staff viewed the situation in Russia as an opportunity for settling Japan's northern problem. The Japanese government was also intensely hostile to communism. And as such, with the aid of other Allied powers, a number of Bolshevik uprisings in the East, including Vladivostok, were stopped. But by the 1920s, it was clear that the Bolsheviks were going to win the civil war in Western Russia. And so the Allied powers withdrew their support while the Japanese military stayed in the Far East until 1922 and only left northern parts of Sakhalin Island in 1925. After agreeing to re-establish what was decided after the 1904 Russo-Japanese War. By the time of the Soviets, Vladivostok was in decline. The retreating forces of the Japanese army removed all material value from the city. Life was paralyzed, there was no money in the banks, the equipment of enterprises had been plundered, and due to mass immigration and repression, the city's population decreased to 106,000. The Germans thrust into Poland from the west and north. In two weeks, the Polish army had virtually ceased to exist. 
Vladivostok managed to get through the Great Patriotic War without direct hostility. This was despite the fact that there was the constant threat of attack from Japan whose naval and military presence vastly exceeded that of the Russians in the region. It also certainly felt inevitable. Why wouldn't Japan take advantage of Russia while it was struggling with the German invasion in the West? While the Japanese may have wanted to invade the Soviet Union, they were simply tied with their war in China and the Pacific region. Subjugating China was a massive undertaking, made more difficult by bad infrastructure. Invading Russia, in addition to China, would have been a bit of a stretch, though such considerations didn't stop others from trying. Although it's not exactly a fair comparison, Germany had massive superiority in terms of its industrial capacity and capability of absorbing losses. Japan didn't. Its total strength was far more limited, though it did have naval superiority. But back to Vladivostok. During the war, it processed cargo in larger quantities than both Murmansk and Arkhangelsk combined. An interesting hero of the war was Anna Shetinina. She was a Soviet merchant marine sailor who became the world's first woman to serve as a captain of an ocean-going vessel, contributing to the transportation of cargo from the US to Vladivostok and aiding in the evacuation of people from Tallinn during the Baltic Sea campaigns. Over 70,000 of Vladivostok's residents were sent to fight on the Western Front protecting Moscow, fighting in Stalingrad, Ukraine, Belarus, and many even marched into Berlin. In the final days of World War II, the military bases at Vladivostok collectively served as the staging points for the offensives against Japanese forces in northeastern China, North Korea, the Sakhalin, and the Japanese Kuril Islands. After the many years of war, Vladivostok wasn't in a great state. The city didn't even have a sewage system going into the 1950s. But overall, Russia was on a path to recovery with the country seeing its standards of living rise. And with Nikita Khrushchev showing particular interest in improving Vladivostok to make it look more like San Francisco, a city which it is often compared with, a number of infrastructure plans were made and Vladivostok was slowly but surely on its way to looking like the modern city of today. While in practice the city had already been closed to foreigners for many years, it was in the 1950s that it was officially closed off to foreigners as it had the important military role of hosting Russia's Pacific fleet. Even Russians themselves needed to receive permits to be allowed to visit, usually needing locals or their family members to request special permission to host them as guests. This was not that unusual during the Soviet era. And even today there are still cities that are closed off that access to which requires special permission. December 26, 1991 was the last day of the Soviet Union and Mikhail Gorbachev resigned the red flag over the Kremlin, replacing it with the Russian tricolor reminiscent of Imperial Russian colors. The next morning, the Soviet people woke up in a new country. The initial shock devastated the economy. Businesses all over the country that used to operate with a helping hand from the Soviet government suddenly had to learn to operate in an open market and compete with foreign businesses. People lost jobs, weren't being paid and had to look for alternative ways of survival. It was a rough, sudden transition. But the people of Vladivostok had one ace up their sleeve that helped them get through the worst of it. <laughs> Japanese cars were first imported to Vladivostok at the end of the 80s, when it was still a closed city. Auto import completely changed the face of the city and the dynamics of its economy. It was a business for the common man, allowing people like officers, fishermen and scientists who lost their jobs get a second chance. Russian residents were amazed by the options available in Japanese cars such as air conditioning and automatic transmission. Some were even happy to exchange their apartments for the imported vehicles. This also meant that in the Far East, the vast majority of cars adopted right side steering wheels, whereas in Russia, traffic is on the left side, as in continental Europe. While the internal market of Vladivostok and Primorsky Krai was relatively small, the business boomed because of all the demand from all over Siberia. Moscow wasn't pleased with the rapid growth of the Far East car market, seeing it as a threat to Russian industry, attempting to prohibit the operation of right-sized steering vehicles in Russia, but the government backed down in the face of many protests. Instead, the government has been slowly ramping up taxes on various methods of importation to make it less profitable. A record number of cars passed into the Far East in 2008, when more than half a million were brought in. A common way of avoiding taxes for the car salesman was to import car parts separately and then assemble the cars in the port. A common myth was that some cars would be literally sawed in half and then welded back together to be sold. 
Though I have not been able to confirm this claim, the used car market has long been predicted to disappear, but it seems that this is still a long way off. According to the Russian census of 2010, Vladivostok's residents include representatives of over 70 nationalities and ethnic groups. But even though it is one of the easternmost metropolitan cities in Russia, the vast majority of people living there are ethnic Russians. And Vladivostok has actually lost a lot of multinational diversity it had going in the 19th century when entire national quarters for Chinese, Korean and Japanese citizens existed, all of which gradually disappeared following the long years of war and turmoil of the early 20th century. Vladivostok is a city with a lot of potential, with open access to Pacific trade routes. It should embrace trade and let its people prosper. Additionally, the region as a whole contains an immense wealth of natural beauty. If Russia embraces openness and change and keeps investing in the infrastructure and educational facilities, then Vladivostok really could someday become the San Francisco of the Far East. But as of now, it still has a long way to go. This does not mean that the city isn't worth a visit, for it has an immense wealth of history, and by being distinctly Russian in its ethnic character, it has lots to give to its Asian visitors who want to experience something essentially European in the far, far east. I recommend watching my video on Khabarovsk, there I go into more detail on the history of the China-Russia border. This is a map of Vladivostok city streets that I made specifically for this video. Please check it out on geoperspective.org where I am also building out a collection of maps. I am also planning on collecting Soviet era posters sometime in the future, so come back to check in for that. Additionally, this is my Patreon map. If you would like to be added to this map, then please consider becoming one of my sponsors. I would truly love to continue creating content for you. Now, leave a comment, guess the location of this footage, and I will see you soon. Share perspective out.